Greetings, and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel. This video is the second video in our knot tying series. The first video was all about bundling knots, which are definitely one of the most frequent type of knots that you're going to use around a homestead or farm is bundling up the trash can, tying a bunch of things together, right? You're just going to be bundling stuff all the time. In this video, we're going to talk about joining ropes together. Now, you can do that with a knot if you want a temporary join between two ropes. You do it with a knot. And a knot which joins two ropes is called a bend. You bend ropes together, okay? But what I want to talk about in this video isn't bend knots, it's splicing. So if you have two ropes that you want to join together permanently to make them one rope, there are splices which you can use to do that. They are smooth. They will still leave it easy to pull the rope through or over other objects. And if done correctly, they are as strong or nearly as strong as the rope was in the first place before it was cut or, you know, as though it was one rope instead of two pieces. Now there's two different types of splices that we're going to talk about and then several variations of one of those, okay? The first is the short splice, which is the easiest and the strongest of the two, but it's kind of fat. So this is a short splice variation that I'm holding up, okay? And this is a short splice variation because this is also a grommet splice. I tied this in such a way that I left a grommet inside the rope so that another rope or object can be easily attached to it. The disadvantage to the short splice is that, as you can see, it thickens the rope quite a bit. So if you want to leave the rope its original thickness, because you have to pull it through a pulley, you use the long splice. And this is a section of rope that I spliced with the long splice. I cut it out of the rope here at the end, but this is what a long splice looks like, okay? And it is more difficult to tie. It's not quite as strong, but only marginally weaker than the short splice. The weakness of the long splice comes more from what, from splices that are improperly tied than from it being an inherently weak joinery system, okay? So that's the long splice. And then we have variations on the short splice. So one being a an eye splice to make a permanent loop in the end of your rope. The other is an end splice, which is a way of, of uh, pointing the end of the rope and it's a very nice treatment to use for thicker, for thick, valuable ropes, because that is a whole lot going to be a whole lot less in your way than some stupid granny knot tied in the end to keep the ends from fraying out. Okay, so that's an end splice, and this is based on the same technique as tying the short splice. And then, lastly, we're going to worm parcel and serve an eye splice. And this is a treatment that we apply to it so that if you have this in a hook for a long period of time, you're up in the barn rafters holding something up for a long period of time with the wind blowing it back and forth, it won't saw through the knot. It won't saw through the rope itself. This uh, whipping material that we put on the outside will keep dirt from getting in and keep the abrasion away from the strong part. Okay? So this is a sacrificial coating that you can put on a rope in order to secure it and prevent that abrasion, okay? So, these are very, very useful things. They are nautical in origin, and I'm only giving you a couple of variations. If you look here and you want all the variations, get the Ashley Book of Knots. This is an old book. It was published in the 30s or 40s, and Mr. Clifford Ashley was a sailor. Um, I believe he was a merchant sailor, and he went around the world. He collected knots. Okay, so if I go to the last knot in the book, it is knot number, knot number, flip. I'm failing at reading books today. Okay, it is knot number 3,854. So there are 3,854 knots in this book, and there's an entire chapter on splices and splice variations. So I'm going to give you the simple quick version for the ones that you will use most around a farm. Like I said, this is nautical in origin, but it is just as useful on a farm as it is on, you know, an age of sail ship, right? 
And if you ever happen to find yourself on an Age of Sail ship, and somebody offers you the chance to splice the main brace, arr, I don't know what that was, um, and earn that extra ration of mint tea that you earn for splicing the main brace, you'll know how to do it. So, come join us, and we'll tie some knots. First splice that we're going to look at is called the short splice. So this is a very simple way to splice two ropes, and it is very, very strong. Those are the two advantages, simplicity and strength. Okay? You simply start by unwinding a section of rope six or so times the diameter of the rope. Okay, so I'm doing about six inches on this. Um, on this three-quarter inch rope. And if the ends are fraying, you want to bind them up a little bit so that these individual yarns don't come completely undone. That is important. I'm using some simple masking tape for this. If you really wanted to be a full stickler for doing it the old-fashioned way, you could do a constrictor knot on this. And the constrictor knot was demonstrated in the bundling knot video. Okay. But we're here, we want to focus on the main idea of doing this particular splice, so we're going to control the raveling of the ends in the simplest way possible to not be distracted with extra complexity. But if you want to know that knot, go and look at the bundling knot video. It's right there. Two more little bits of tape and we'll be ready to go. Okay, there's one and there's a two. Okay, this doesn't have to be any particular neatness with the tape. Now while you're working with these, it's good to, it's a good idea to put a temporary piece of tape so that they don't just slowly crawl, so that this, this juncture doesn't just crawl ever so, you know, back, 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 the more you're working with these ends, <laughs> okay? So that's just a, a just in case. But we do end up having to take that right off as soon as we are ready to make the splice. Now the first thing we want to do in terms of actually making the short splice is we're going to interweave these loose ends just like you would end mesh your fingers. Okay, right? If you're just doing this, that's all we're going to do. So this is a three yarn rope. So if we have two up here, we'll have one up there. We're just going to put those two over the bottom one here and the top one through the top two over there. Like I said, just so that they're in mesh just as you would your fingers. Okay. And now the splice is a simple weaving pattern. Okay. Pull these in tight. Pull that Mary in tight. And then we're just going to go with each yarn. It's going to go over one and then under the next. Okay. So this one is going over here. So it's going to go under here. To tuck it under, we're going to use a tool called a fid. A fid can be anything. In this case, I'm using just a bent piece of wire. We just have to open up the weave of the rope enough that we can stick the yarn through. Okay. On smaller ropes, right, something really small, you wouldn't really do a splice like this on something this small, but if you have smaller rope, you can use a, a large crochet hook for a fid. And on really big rope, it was traditional to use um, a big wooden dowel that was tapered down. Okay, Sometimes you can even just, on this light stuff, just pick it up with your fingers. It's not important how you fit it up, just that you can get your weave in over this one and under that one. Okay, So that is one complete weave. Okay. Now you're going to be doing 
both sides the same. So this will be treated just in exactly the same way. This yarn is going over this one, so it will go under the next one. Okay. This going over this one, so under that one. And then over this one, so under that one. Okay? Just like so. And then neaten it up. And you can see what we're accomplishing. Now, that's one weave, one pass on each side of this rope. You would do, to make a complete short splice, six full pass or six full passes, three on each end. Okay? So this would go, this yarn will go over that, under that, over that, under that. To end up all the way back here. Okay? Then same, this one would be over under, over under, over under, and end up tucked underneath that one at the end of the day. Okay? So your finished splice would be from here to here. That's why you need that good, healthy, little more than six times the diameter of your, of your rope, so you have enough length that you can go out like that. Okay, and that is all that there is to making the short splice. Very simple, very straightforward, and very strong. Okay, but it's also very fat. <laughs> and that's the problem. If you have a pulley sheath with this size for three quarter inch rope, this is going to be more like inch and a quarter to inch and a half here in the middle, and it will jam in the pulley. Okay. So there is a variation on this called the long splice, which we can use if we want to have a splice rope connection that is capable of going through a pulley without jam. So I'm just gonna untwist this and show you the long splice with this same piece. So the long splice is pretty close to exactly twice the length of the short splice. So we're going to start out the same way by unlaying, if the lay of the rope is the twist of the rope, unlaying the rope so that now it's you know 12 to 14 times the diameter of the rope. It takes quite a bit of rope in order to do this. Okay. Now we're going to start off the same way. We're going to intertwine and marry these ends together just like we did in the first go round. Okay? And now we're going to take it for the long splice though, we're going to unwrap it, but we're going to take a different approach and we're going to utilize this whole length. Okay, so instead of having all of the entanglement all in one narrow spot, we're going to spread it out. So it will thicken the rope slightly, but there will only be a little bit. There will be a little bit of thickness over here and a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit over there. Okay, so we're going to take these and we're going to take these, these yarns in pairs. So there's two yarns that will act as a pair. These are two yarns that will act as a pair. And these are two yarns that will act as a pair. Okay. So the pair that I'm going to work with first, what I want to do, get all these others out of the way, okay, and I'm going to use about three quarters of this length that I have available in the first step. And that first step is I'm going to unwind the standing end and as I unwind the standing end, I'm going to simultaneously work the tag end into the groove that's being left by the yarn, which is being unwound. Okay. So I'm undoing and rebuilding the rope at the same time. Okay. Just like that. Now, 
we need to get this locked in place. And we're going to do that by first tying an overhand knot. And then eh, pull a little too hard. Letting that cinch down in. And at this point, it's actually a good idea to let this standing end fray a little bit so that that can nestle down in. Okay. And then you can roll it. Okay. Again, we don't want a big width increase. Now we're going to weave this over under once. This is, and now this is where a wire loop can really come in handy because I can use that kind of like a big old crochet hook and pull that in. Okay. Roll it to get it down in place, right? You want it to be nice and neat, just like that. And then the same thing over here. Okay. Get that nestled in, nice and tidy, and then this over under once. And then you do the same deal. Okay? So you have, and that's all you're going to do with this. I'll fray that out a little bit. On the short splice, I said you want to work it in and through three times. On the long splice, you're only going to do one tuck on each. Now, this will be where we finish. We're going to do the same side with our second pair over on this end of the rope. Okay. Is everything still in view here, beloved? to trim these ends is a hatchet. I'm just going to use this little bit of carving block here because I do need to get a little bit of this out of the way. Hatchet is definitely the go-to method for cutting thick rope. not all completely tidied up but you can see where we're going with it and then here since there's this is dead center it's right in the middle there's nowhere else to go we're just going to tie an overhand knot right there in the middle and just like before get her nestled down in once it's not nice and nestled over under once on this side Kind of allow the yarn to spread out, kind of fray out a little bit there, nestle in, and then 
over under once on this side. for that tuck. And then chop it off. <coughs> and again, carving blocks, carving cradles, these are disposable items. Let me get rid of some of this. And we have one long splice. Now, that's a lot more involved. And truth be had, it's more work. And at the same time, at the same time that it's more work and more difficulty and a little harder to get right and takes a little more practice to get right, it's not as secure and as strong as the short splice. Okay? Partly because you know you don't have that full and meshing weave. Partly because you only have a single tuck on each of the loose ends instead of three tucks on each of the loose ends, right? So the the reason the only reason you would do this is if you have to get it through a pulley. The second reason that you would want to do this in smaller cord, like quarter inch rope or something like that, would be if you were um, plating or weaving with rope and you needed to extend your line, okay? You can use a long splice in a weaving project in lieu of a knot and it will be a smooth connection and then when it's woven into the finished plating project, it won't be visible that there's even a connection there. Right, because this would then be you know twisted around and plated with however you were weaving it together, and that will hold it the rest of the way. So you use the long splice when you have to maintain the thickness of the rope as close as possible to its original thickness, and you use the short splice in every other circumstance. Now. The now, let's use that short splice for some other cool stuff. Firstly, we can use it to finish off the end of a rope. This is called rope pointing. And some rope pointing knots are, are extremely complex and some involve tapering the yarns and you know, like actually making it to you know a, come to a true point, right? But on rope this size, at the scale that you're going to be working, you know, with, with even large farmstead ropes, right, you don't need it to be truly pointy. You just need it to be neat and tidy. And I'm sure you've all seen a rope where somebody just came and, you know, did one of these granny knots to keep it from unfraying, right? And that's miserable because you got to tie a knot with this thing still. you got that big hunk of nonsense junk in there, right? So we don't want to do that. We want to do it neater, but it doesn't have to truly be pointy. So we're going to take these yarns and we're going to weave them back on themselves in the same fashion as the short splice. And that'll leave a nice finished end. But in order to do it, if you just kind of come and start doing this, they're just going to keep unweaving and unweaving and unweaving the more you pull tension. So we need to have a knot, a stopper knot to prevent that from happening. This is called the crown knot. Okay. And the crown knot, if you've ever done like a, like the square plastic lanyard braid for like keychains, that's a crown knot. Okay, it's a four strand crown knot. But here we want a three strand crown knot. So we're gonna spread these out, take one, bring it toward us, loop the other, put the, over, the, the one to the left over top of it. So now it's pointing to my right. And then this other one's gonna come, it's gonna go over that, one that we just pointed to the right and through the initial loop, okay? And then when we cinch this down, okay, when we cinch that down, it makes this nice little bulbous knot. Okay. It's a little bit larger than the diameter of the rope, but not by more than the rest of the 
weaving process is going to make it. So we're going to fit through. We're just going to do exactly the same thing as we had been doing. Making a nice fit might be a fun video here. Bone fit with scrimshaw or something fun like that. With this thin rope, I usually find once I've used it to pry one up, I can usually kind of do most of the rest of it with just with my fingers. Okay. There's one round of weaving. Then pull it all tight because we just jimmied it all around. Okay. That's kind of where we quit in the uh, short splice demonstration, but this time we'll go all the way through with it. Fit that one under. And this one's loose enough. Nah, I need to pry that. Making a wooden fit is a great project for a, long, a, a young lad who wants to go whittle something, because it's just a pointy stick. Could be a lad, could be a lass. Could be a lad, could be a lass. Could be a boplin. <laughs> or... Could be a 40-year-old human who just got a cool new knife and wants to play with it. <laughs> right? And now we're going to go for the third run. Of these weavings. That one's being cooperative. And this one's actually being cooperative, too. Okay. So there we have our crown knot and short splice end treatment. Okay? So that is just a very simple... See, that didn't take me much time at all. There's no fast motion here. That, that, that hardly took, took much time at all, right? And that is a very nice end treatment for this rope which will permanently prevent that end from fraying and from, you know, Uncle Bubba from coming and tying some stupid knot in the end of this when he's over to visit, right? We got we to keep that from happening. So now you know how to do this with the short splice. And this is the length that each side ends up when you're using that two splice rope. Let's look at some other cool ways that we can do stuff with the short splice. One of the things that we can do with this, with this short splice and its modified forms, is we can make grommets in a rope, right? Built into the rope itself. If we're going to have to go through, cross lines, have a tie-off point in the middle of the rope because you want to pull it in some other direction, there's a lot of reasons you could want to have a grommet in a rope. This will do that for us. What we do is instead of taking these two ends and coming in end-to-end -end like we did before, we're going to step back put this one piercing into the side of the rope here, and then when we fray this end out, we'll pierce it in that way, and the crossover point will be our grommet, okay? So I did a little layout here. This is how much I want to unlay. This is what I want to be the grommet. I marked those in tape, and now I'm going to come in here the same way as I have been, but I'm gonna come in at an angle. And this can be a little bit tricky to get the first row started. Okay, there's one going under that one. Now the next yarn is going to come under underneath the next curl. Okay, and then roll the rope. And the next yarn is going to come underneath the next curl here. And then you just kind of have to work that in and make the rope be happy with it because it's not really all that happy with it. Um, you, you can make a decision. This is twisting it at a kind of a funny angle. So I'm going to switch these two. 
put this one underneath there. Now this can curl over that, go underneath here, or just all the way under there. Getting the first one in is sort of a guess and check. You just have to fiddle with it, right? And then pull it tight. See if you like it. See if it's workable. Okay. Like that first one, it was just so, so strained. It was never going to make a tidy cinch. Okay. So that's number one. Now, don't even need that. Over under. Over under. Over under. That's two. There's my two tucks. Then number three, over under, over under, and over under. Okay, so there's my three rounds of weaving that in. Roll it, get it seated nice, and make sure it's neat. Because if this first one is not neat and tidy, you're going to have a real blinger of a time getting the second one in. The first one is always a little easier than the second one. So take your time with it. Okay. And then to do the second one, it's just exactly the same idea. Right? We will un untie these ends. My fingernails would work. There we go. Fray them out, take the ends off, and then come around and start tucking here to make that grommet in the middle of the rope. I'm gonna do this, I'll show you what it looks like when it's done. Now, here you have the uh, finished grommet. So this is just a full length finished short splice with a hole in it, <laughs> okay? But that's very useful, you can tie a knot in here and you know there's even ways let me grab some of these cut off yarns from that long splice right if these were coming in through here this can continue on itself right you could have these two yarns come through if you wanted to permanently join two ropes at a 90 degree angle the other one through this way right with these being the standing ends and then turn these around and splice them back up in and then you'd have a permanently attached 90 degree attachment right so you could just keep having fun with this there's no end to what you can do with this but we are going to do one more end treatment and that is to you know to complement our end pointing that i showed previously we can also do an end loop a spliced loop okay which is kind of it's loopy like the mid-rope grommet that I just did, and it's endy like the end splice, but we're just going to put a loop in the end, <laughs> okay? And this starts exactly the same way as the mid-rope grommet splice, okay? We weave the ropes, we re weave the yarns in, um, I think I want to take this one under that one, I'm trying to keep it as even as possible. And every once in a while, you're going to have one of these that just fights you. Just keep doing it, right? You can keep doing it. There's no, there's no time limit here. We do want these to come out a little bit more even than that. That's not good. Um, okay, that needs to come out that way. So then this one, I, I want to have come through this. You just have to start, look at it, play with it, figure it out. Okay, so that one's going under that one. Okay, 
this one is going under that one. So this needs to interact with this one. I need to pull it forward and get it through there. Hey, there we go. Like I said, you just have to fiddle with it and figure it out. Okay? And then we start our weave. Now, in so far, I've just stopped with the weaving stage. But we want to also finish these off nice. So I'm going to finish weaving this one, this end splice, this uh, loop splice off camera. Okay. And I'm going to get everything out and I'll show you how we do a nice whipping to tie these ends down. So here we have it finished and um, now we need to really get it seated down in. So we want to flatten all of those ends. So I've trimmed them, I've taken the tape off. Now we want these to really enmesh well. Okay. So we're just going to kind of give it a bit of a pounding there, get it back, you know, flatten all the high spots, tug these tight again, give it a bit of a roll. You want to do all of this before you do your finish whipping. Okay. If there's a spot that's still refusing to kind of lay flat, you can tap on it with a hammer there again. Okay. Such as that. Now, it's good to fray this out so that it will help it lay flatter. Okay. But obviously, you know, we want a neater finish than this when we're all done. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some shorter cords, it's just from a ball of jute here. Um, I'm going to point this the other I'm going to get it all tangled. Make sure you get it all tangled. Okay. I'm going to point this the other way just because it's going to be easier for me as a righty. Now that we've beaten the tar out of our rope here, um, could, that could be literal if it was a tarred rope. Anyway, um, we're going to put on a whipping. So we want to tie all these ends down nice. So we're going to take our fid. We're going to put our whipping cord on her there. Pull that through the rope. This will help keep the whipping from moving, from wanting to slide up or down on the rope because now it goes through the twist. I'm going to take this with my hand, brush that end back along with all of these frayed ends from the standing end of our rope. And now I'm just going to start taking turns around here and I'm going to white knuckle it every turn. Now I'm going to pull this end down in tight, get that all cinched together. This is just a simple whipping. There are absolutely a lot of complicated fancy ones. You can use a Turk's head knot as a whipping if you're so inclined. For any sort of practical rope work, you probably should not do that because it's a gigantic waste of time. But if you want to do something fancy, you certainly can. And you see, I am, you know, with each turn of this, I am giving it the business as best as I can there. And now when I get close, I'm going to take a little loop of the same cord, take the loop, and put the loop sticking in the direction that I'm working the whipping. Then wrap that loop in, keep going around.
Okay. You want at least five or six turns over the loop there. Now you're going to take the end, stick it through. Just give it a, an inch or so through. You don't want to try and pull the whole cord through this way. You're going to get, grab the loop you left in there, Ugh! grunt, and pull it out. Okay. Now, that unseated some of my whipping. That can happen, so I want to re rearrange all of that. Okay. And then we're going to cinch that down nice and tight. Okay. There you go. Now we have whipped the ends down. Just cut that off with our handy dandy hatchet. Okay. And I did disturb that a little bit more than I wanted, but that's the idea, right? You can always go back and redo one of these, fix that if you want to. Um, for a uh, practical, I want to use this for something rope, there's absolutely no reason that you have to do that. But for aesthetic reasons, if you wish to, go for it. Okay. Whippings on these are kind of considered an expendable part. right? These will come loose. These will loosen over time. So they will work out. And you know, ropes that, that are being used a lot are going to have to be re-whipped periodically to keep these ends down. And, you know, in the days of the wooden sailing ships, when these ropes were up and down pulleys every, you know, several times every day, that's one of the jobs that people would sit around and do, would be pull out a bunch of ropes that whippings were coming loose, put up new ones, and then re-whip the old ones and put them back in storage. Okay? So that is a part that gets replaced from time to time. It's not totally permanent. I am going to go ahead and whip these. Then I'm going to put a loop on this end and finish off this little sampler. And then when we're all done with, with this, I'm going to show you a couple of the things that you can do to one of these loops in order to make it wear resistant so that this won't wear through if it's sitting and working against a hook and eye or some sort of attachment for a long period of time. We're going to do three separate operations to this little loop to help protect it from chafing and wearing through if it was going to be in a long-term installation. You can go and you can get little metal straps that wrap around it and do the same thing. And if you want to go get those, if you can find one of those is appropriately sized, you can absolutely go for it and then you don't have any need to do what I'm about to do. But I wanted, since we're making this kind of loop, to show you the traditional way to do this so that you have it in your, you know, mental toolbox, okay? And it's not hard. It's a little time consuming, so I'm gonna cut in and out a couple times, but it's not difficult in any way. The three steps are worm, parcel, and serve, okay? Now there's a little saying, worm and parcel with the lay, turn and serve the other way, okay? Keep that in your mind. Worming is where we're going to take a piece of small cord and use it to fill the gaps in between the yarns in this big twisted cable. Okay, that's worming. Parceling, we're going to take a strip of fabric and wrap it around to keep dirt from working itself into the rope and wearing it out from the inside. Okay. And then serving is a tight wrap that will actually take the abrasion. Okay? So the lay of the rope is the direction of twist. So worm is the first step. So as I always do, we're going to poke our worming cord, and my cords are falling all over the place. Get over there, staple, there we go. We're going to poke our, our worming cord through, okay? just so that it's anchored in at least one twist of the rope. And then we're going to worm with the lay. And you're going to need to do this three times. And just keep going 
in the same groove. Once you start in a groove, you just want to stay in that same groove. Okay. Then when we get to the end of our loop, we will fit the end through. Then we want to pull it as tight as is practical, but remember this is the worming is not structural. Okay, this is just so that we can do a nice, neat, smooth job later on. Okay, and check it. I actually jumped here. I made a mistake. I jumped out of the groove and into a different one. So I need to pull that out and fix it. There. Coming around that way, and I'll fit it in here. There we go. So we're going to do this three times, and this is just going to make the rope smoother so that the parceling and the serving will lay nice and flat for us. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and finish these other two off camera, and then we'll pop back on. So I have finished with the worming, and again, the goal here is just to make it nice and neat, right? We're, we're going to make this is just to smooth it out for the next step. Okay? Could you skip the worming? Yes. Does it make the serving more difficult at the end of this process? Also, yes, because <laughs> your, your, your curls are going to want to fall all over each other. So this is going to make the last step easier. On rope this small, probably wouldn't be a big deal, but you know we might as well learn to do it right in the first place. Okay? I've clipped all of these cords short, but I've left some little hangers on there. And we're going to wrap this down with the parceling. So I've taken a strip of fabric, and this can be anything. I just had some scrap denim sitting around, so I'm going to do this in blue. Um, you know, any cotton fabric, any and anything will work here. It's not important. We're just having a dust shield to keep bits of grains of dust and sand and gritty stuff from getting into the core, and then they'll work against the rope as it worries, and that can start to break strands on the inside, and you don't realize it's been happening. Okay, so this will keep the rope, this is just to keep the rope clean. Okay, so I used the fid to pull this through. I have a little tail there. I'm just going to wrap that down as I start around. I'm going to tie all of these little base curls in. Okay, again, keep everything. The neater you keep all of this, make sure I trap those under the first turn of our parceling fabric. The neater you keep all of this, the easier and the better it will work. Okay. And then you just want to pull this as tight as you can. And then as I go up, you see how the angle of my parceling fabric is the same as the angle of the rope. Okay, Worm and parcel with the lay. Okay. This parceling, like you're just wrapping it into a bundle like you would a parcel to take to the post office. Parcel just means bundle. Gonna get a little bit of extra material in the bottom of the bend there. That's okay.
for outdoor use rope would traditionally be tanned soaked in tannic acid just like leather because that contributes to fungal decay resistance and it would be soaked in some sort of rosin, pine resin, pine pitch, coal tar, something like that. And then the bundling fabric would be done the same. Cool. I'm going to fit this through. I always like to fit everything through. It keeps it nice and tucked. Keeps stuff from working up and down as the rope worries. Okay, tore, that's okay. No, that was not intentional, but it's also not a problem because I have enough tail here. Okay? So we have wormed and parceled with the lay. Now we're going to turn and serve the other way. So I have my parceling cord, and you do need a big long length of this. So if you have a netting needle, which is kind of like a, a weaver's shuttle, right? But used for netting, so it would be a great time to use it. Otherwise, you can kind of just bundle up your, your length of cord, sort of kind of like this, and it'll do basically the same thing. Okay. So, I'm going to start, as we always do, I lost my end. Pliers are handy. We like pliers. There we go. Okay. Turn and serve the other way. So, if you were going clockwise, now you're going to go counterclockwise. And this is the serving where we're just wrapping. Along. Now, if you can, of course, if you run out of cord, you can, of course, join them. When this was historically done to entire ropes, it would be done off a spool, and then when you join two spools. You would, of course, have to do it with a knot. Okay. So we're up to the base. And now we're going to start going through. And every turn, pull as tight as you possibly can. going around. And we'll see if I guessed right at how much cord I'll need. But you can see how nice and round this is. Okay, This would be all lumpy and a lot more difficult to keep these turns parallel to each other if we had not done the worming underneath the parcel. And as you see, as we go around with this, once this is has something attached to it, it's going to work against this outer coating the inner parts would be protected from abrasion. I'm not going to have enough cord. I can already see that. That's okay. I'll get to show you how to join it.
Now this, this outer coating, all of this is inherently and deliberately sacrificial. Heavy rope is expensive. Even today, heavy rope is expensive. It was even more expensive back in the day. Whereas this light cord you wrap around could be any old worn out thing that you wanted to use. And as such, would be a lot cheaper. So I'm gonna pull this out as flat as I can as I'm working around this curve. so long and somebody would come with a big old dull knife and scrape it and scrape the fluff apart and that was used for oakum which would be pounded into the cracks in various constructions most notably the planking of ships to make them waterproof and in between logs and log houses would be oakum packed. It's still done, you can still buy it, but usually now oakum is just made as oakum. Our little log cabin has oakum packed in it. <clears throat> the sad part of that history is that that's one of those jobs that was frequently relegated to prisoners, people in poor houses, de facto slavery. Probably wasn't great for their lungs either. No, it wasn't. Being in that dust all the time was very bad for their lungs. Mm -hmm. I might just have enough to do this. You can see a little bit of the parceling fabric sticking out, but that's okay. You're always going to have a difference in radius when you're going around a curve like this. So these wraps on the inside are almost overlapping at the edges. Can mm -hmm. you see this, Will Hunt? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. These wraps here in the middle are overlapping in a few instances, even while the ones on the outside are, are not really touching correctly. And that's one of those, it just is what it is, don't worry about it. If all of this was tarred, it would all be the same color anyway, and you'd never even see it. It shows up because of my uh, choice of materials. Okay, actually need to undo a couple wraps here. We're going to finish this off with a pull-through loop. Before I forget, finish our loop. did calculate this just about right. I'll show you how we finish it. Then I'll show you how you would join it if I have not calculated it right, because that's pertinent information. Okay. It's touching here. When I'm using a pull-through loop, I like to go one extra turn to pull it through the loop because you're going to lose a little bit of slack when you snug it up. Ugh, give her a good pull. And there you go. And then you 
you snip it off. Leave a little bit of a tag dangle. In any circumstance where you're using this rope, that little tag dangle is not going to be a problem. So there you go. That is a heavy, heavy duty loop that we just made. Okay. Worm, parcel, and serve. Worm and parcel with delay. Turn and serve the other way. And you do that, you'll get this nice, smooth, perfectly round finish. And it's a lot easier to do the serving. Okay? Now, I'm going to get this out of the way. I'm going to cut a couple short pieces of rope. I'll show you how we do a connection. If, if we had run out of rope in this. Now, just for a last parting thought, I wanted to talk about joining two ropes together with a knot when you're working with these little serving cords and whipping cords and things like that. We will do a video at some point on bends, which are knots to tie two ropes together, but kind of the most universal and most useful for this sort of natural cordage is the sheet bend. Okay, So to tie a sheet bend, you're going to take the first rope and you're going to make a loop. You're going to take the second rope, you're going to come up through that loop, you're going to come around it, okay, and I'm going to do for this, if you want it to be permanent or if your rope is really stiff, do a double sheet bend. If you aren't so worried about that, you can do a single. So I'm going to do the double here. I'm going to go through this loop that I just created, pull that tight, come around, go through again, okay. pull that tight here because there's a lot of friction in these natural cordages. Okay. I'm going to pull that down, hold that, and I'm going to slide it down on the loop. Okay. And that is very, very secure. Okay and it's reasonably small. Okay, it's not super small, it's not the smallest, but it's a good knot that you can use. And you can do one loop through if it's going to be temporary, if you don't need as much strength, or if your cord is looser. Okay, If you're using a really slippery synthetic cord, you want to go to a blood knot and do something like that or a surgeon's knot. But this is an easy, kind of universal knot that you can use for tying two things together like this. And it won't tumble the way a mistied square knot, or worse yet, a granny knot under the best of circumstances. Um, it won't tumble the way those knots will tumble. So use a sheet bend. You can do one or two loops. I just did the two loop version. Then you can cut these really short. And yep, you got a knot. Make sure you don't put it in an awkward place, but then you can continue wrapping your project, okay? And this is very, very, very strong knot, but it's bulkier than a splice. So, we have four applications of the similar idea, the short splice, the long splice, and then we can use the short splice for making grommets, loops, and treatments, okay? I am going to keep let me grab them here off the floor where I just unceremoniously chucked them. I am going to keep this and this, and we're going to do some other interesting things with these in future not work videos. So if you've enjoyed this, I would be most grateful if you gave her a big old thumbs up as that helps the YouTube algorithm know that you enjoyed it and just show it to other folks. And if you want to, um, See where we go with this. Make sure that you subscribe, and we'll see you here next time at Old Ways Rising Farm.